الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله continuing our study of Kitab al Nikah the book of uh, marriage in Bulugo Maram uh, chapter 5 the division of visits to one's wives and this is an incredibly important chapter especially for those who are in polygamous uh, relationships uh, or those who want to be or those who are thinking about it and considering it uh, to know the rights and the responsibilities and know the rights of the wives the rights of the wives and so we reach the 910th hadith in accordance with my uh, my copy of Bulugha Maram and this is the hadith of, of Urwa radiallahu ta'ala narrated Urwa radiallahu ta'ala anha Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said O oh my nephew this is the hadith of Urwa Uh, narrated uh, radiallahu ta'ala an uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said O oh my nephew Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not prefer some of us over others regarding the division of the time he would spend with us it was very rare that he would not visit us all and come near each of his wives without having intercourse with her till he reached the one whose day it was and spent the night with her. Reported by Ahmed and Abu Dawood, the wording is Abu Dawood's and Al Hakam uh, graded it as Sahih or authentic. A Muslim reported Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha as saying when Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered the Asr prayer, he would sit, uh, he would visit his wives in turn, then come close to them to kiss or hug them, the narrator reported the rest of the hadith. Uh, these hadith, these two hadith are incredibly important for us to understand uh, the qism, understanding the division. And they give us uh, immense insight into the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and how he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam divided his time with his wives and the rights of the wives and something which is very very important which is a right of uh, whether one is in the marital uh, bond with more than one wife or one wife very important is giving the wives their right and having gentleness and being comforting to them so we learn all of this from these two ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and unfortunately this differs to what many of us are upon and what many of us practice. So it should be a reminder and an admonition and an encouragement to follow the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam to be good with the wives. That that is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the sunni should uh, is more than encouraged, should be more than encouraged to practice this very, very important uh, uh, sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam of being kind gentle visiting and 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 being uh excellent with one wives and the prophet sallallahu was the best of examples as he sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in another hadith from the main benefits of this hadith are these two hadith the first is the husn al khulq of the nabi of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the excellent manners of the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam as we've talked about countless times and his ways of interaction with his wives and his family sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he was uh, vigilant about being uh, uh, excellent and good with his family and the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam said khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi wa ana khayrukum li ahli he said, the best of you is those who are best with their families. And I am the best of you uh, with my family. Meaning the Prophet said, and I'm the best of, of, of you who is uh, the best with his family. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if one were to reflect upon the seerah or the, the, uh, the, autobi the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to really sit down and analyze and look at how he treated his family, uh, that they will find that he was the best in being just and kind and giving the rights to his family. And he laid, us, laid down the sunnah for us. And this is in opposition to those people who try to criticize the Prophet ﷺ. Even amongst Muslims, you have individuals and some people who claim to be uh, adherent and pushing forward women's rights that even have some an undertone of criticism. Because it's very dangerous. It can even be kufr to criticize the Prophet So it shows it's a very dangerous practice. Those people who belittle. This is from Iman. This is a part of Iman. Oh, uh, this is a part of faith. The Prophet uh, said in the Hadith of Jibreel, uh, when, when asked about Iman, he said, He said, It is to believe in Allah and to believe in His angels. And His uh, books. And His prophets. So, uh, believing in the Prophet is from Islam. It is the assass of Islam. Kitab wa sunnah. Follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that leaves no room for criticizing, belittling, or thinking ill, or articulating something ill about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's something we have to be very cautious of. So the Prophet Wasallam was the best. As he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, which is from our Iman as well, Khayrakum khayrakum li ahli. The best of you is the best of those to their family. And I'm the best of you towards uh, my family. You know, meaning uh, I'm the best of you uh, with regards to being with, uh, with, 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 with families. The Prophet had, was the best in giving the rights and showing that beautiful example because he was the Prophet of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also illustrates for us the importance of following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in everything. But in particular, this hadith illustrates especially in this matter. And uh, the way in which we can do that is by being gentle, by being kind, by being respectful, by being loving towards our spouses. And we've talked about this uh, many times in this chapter. And that also that we should strive our best not to be far from them. Far physically, but far, uh, far yes, as physically as far as uh, being in another locality, if possible, but also likewise not to be far even when you're in their presence, not to be removed from them, but to establish those, those ties. That's very important as far as being... Uh, uh, in, in the marital bond. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us uh, that the permissibility, this is very important for us to understand this, the permissibility that the one who has more than one wife, for him uh, to be able to visit his all of his wives, even in one day, his, his other wives, that is permissible. But he should not do anything that's what's going to cause excessive jealousy or uh, favoritism for example, a man who has three wives and he always visits one, on, uh, one particular one on the days of the others. But rather, no, he should be just even in this. So it is permissible for the men during the day to spend some time and go check on the needs of his other wives and families uh, every day or uh, especially if there's some necessity to do so. And that is not considered... Uh, being oppressive or having shortcomings with regards to the divisions. So it's very important for us to have this understanding uh, and uh, and we get this understanding from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam who is the most just and the most uh, the best in giving those rights. Another benefit of this hadith is that it also illustrates for us 
uh, that we, can, we, we benefit from this hadith is that the more that a person, uh, that a man, that he's close to his, his family, to his wives, that uh, this will increase the love between them, meaning the love between the husband and the wife, or the love between the husband and the wives, that this will keep from the hearts becoming hard and distance from one another, but rather should visit and give gifts and be kind and gentle and respectful to, uh, towards one's wives. And this will increase the love. And we, are, we mentioned about the reasons in the beginning of uh, the talking about the uh, division of wives. We mentioned some of those things that some of the scholars mentioned, which can inc help increase the love between the spouses. Another benefit of this hadith is that also with regards to that, if uh, if uh, one is visiting his other wives and it's not their time, that he should not have relations with them. Meaning a man, if it is wife X's night and he goes to visit wife Z during the day, he should not have relations with her. He should not have sexual intercourse. And this was uh, from the statement where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said, Min ghayra masis. Uh, without um, masis, meaning like uh, touching, but here the meaning is jima, meaning uh, to have sexual intercourse. So that the husband, because, and there are some of the hikmah for this, uh, a couple of reasons. One of the reasons that, and, and this is uh, from uh, wisdom, that's apparent wisdom is that for one, of course, it would cause jealousy with the other wife if she were to find out. Number two, it also can weaken the husband. Unless, you know, many men are not able to perform and function like that, especially as they get older, to have that same prowess. It depends upon the individual. Every man is different. And the Prophet ﷺ was the best of us. And he was able to have relations with all of his wives in a single day. With one, as, as is mentioned in another hadith. And this shows us that men, they differ on different levels. But one should avoid this. And this is in accordance with this hadith of Aisha. Because she said, uh, she said, Oh, my nephew, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would not prefer some of us over others regarding the division of the time he would spend with us. It was very rare that he would not visit us all and come near each of his wives without having, sex, uh, without having intercourse with her till he reached the one whose day it was and spent the night with her. So letting us know that from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, what was his habit is that he would not have relations with his other wives. And we just mentioned two reasons why. The jealousy that can be caused and also another reason is that the, the the strength that if he has had relations with one wife, he may not be able to with the wife whose night it is. And so this takes away some of his prowess and some of his, his power. Uh, and so this is why it's important to try to be just in every which way. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, uh, and also along with that, uh, that needs to be mentioned, is that also that does not prohibit other actions because again it's your it is your wife it's not that you're not uh, you cannot be affectionate towards her but it's just talking about the sexual intercourse and things which are going to weaken you for being with your other family when it's her right and it's her night so therefore if a man uh, kisses his 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 wife or fondles her or what have you and it's not her day, then this is okay as long as it is not going to cause him to be weak uh, with regards to the other family whose night it, it is, uh, as long as it's not going to take away from, you know, and if it's her time, we're talking about if this is her time during the other wife's time. If it is one particular wife, wife X's time, and the husband has visited another wife to check on her, and then he fondles her or kisses her or what have you, but he should not have relations with her and he should not do those things which are going to take away from his time with the one who's right, who's haq it is. If, if he is someone who may, uh, karamakum Allah, ejaculate and these things are very important for us to talk about because they are real issues so we should not have shyness as in the hadith uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was at, you know, uh, I think it was um, uh, um, uh, Sulaim 
uh, Imrata Abi Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhum, I believe, I can't recall exactly, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, in the Laha la yastahi min al haq Verily, Allah is not shy of the truth. Fahal ala mar'a ghusl idhiya kalamat. Is, uh, must a woman take a ghusl if she ejaculates? So this is a very strong uh, 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 um, a question. So this is why we should not have shy shyness when it comes to asking about important things. We should have shyness as in not being rude and not being uh, uh, vile in our speech. But however, when something needs to be articulated, for example, a woman is asking a question to Ahl al-Ilm or writing the question to Ahl al-Ilm or whatever the case may be, then she can do that in a way so that she articulates what she needs to talk about. If it's something which is personal like that, uh, personal or even sexual in nature, that is relevant to a Sharia hukum, then in the law halayastihim al haq, very the law is not shy of the truth. So then it is important to ask if one needs to know those Sharia uh, uh, and to know about these issues. Another benefit of this hadith. Uh, this is that that the asl of the qism, as is mentioned in this chapter, uh, is that it has to do with uh, the, the, the the origin of the division, the main pillar of the dividing between uh, the rights of the wives. This right, this most important right, is that night, is spending the evening with a particular wife, that that's her night. And then another wife, it's her night. And the other wife, if you have another, it's her night. Or whoever's night, that that's the asal of the kism, of the division. The division is referring to time. And also, of course, being just. You have to be just with that division, the division of time. And of course, just, as we mentioned, in the spending. Another uh, benefit, a last benefit that we'll mention with regards to this hadith is uh, that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, although he was so busy leading the Ummah of Muhammad, leading his Ummah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and being the Imam, being the leader, the ruler, being the judge, and and all the other responsibilities that he had that he did, that, that did not take away from him, also giving rights to his wife. So giving everyone their due rights. And that's very important to understand that as men, we often have various responsibilities and, and, and tasks to fill as far as earning the livelihood in Arijal Qawi Muna Ala Nisa, that the men are the maintainers and protectors of the women, that that's a right that the women have over you, that you work and you take care of your wife or wives. And likewise, if you have children, to give them their haq, and your parents, you give them their haq, and all these various responsibilities. Also, you have to take care of so many other responsibilities. So it's very important to know that even with all those responsibilities, it does not take away from the fact that they still have rights over you. And a last point I want to mention, and this is related to this, and we've asked the ulama countless times, mm -hmm. is even those people busy with ilm, that they should not allow the knowledge, even if they're a da'i calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a great thing, they should not give up uh, to do this act which is maybe mustahab for them, maybe it's a recommended thing of giving da'wah that should not supersede the right, the responsibility, which is the haq that their wives have over them with time and as well as um, spending and, and other things. In the 911th hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, during the illness of which Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, he was asking, where shall I be tomorrow? He desired that it would be Aisha's day. His wives therefore permitted him to stay where he wished, and he stayed in Aisha's house. Mutafakun alayhi agreed upon in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, it means that during illness, mere intention of a permanent stay with one of the wives is not an offense. It also means that with the permission of the other wives, one can stay with one of them. The illness of the Prophet ﷺ began at the house of Maymuna. Uh, so this hadith also illustrates for us 
what we and, and reaffirms for us what we already stated in the prior hadith about the uh, seeking the permission and the permissibility of a woman giving up her uh, right for one of the other wives specifically or in general that this is her right so she has the right to give up her right if she wishes without due pressure from the husband. Some of the main benefits we gain from this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was human, was a man and that he was affected with what other human beings were are affected with, with illness, with death, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so this hadith uh, affirms for us, and as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said in the hadith, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشْرُ الْمِثْلَكُمْ أَنْسَى كَمَا تَنْسُونَ The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Verily, I'm a, a man, a human being, just like you are. And I forget as you forget. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam Affirm for us that he's a human, unlike those people who claim that the Prophet ﷺ was light and the Prophet ﷺ was, uh, you know, not subjected to, um, to, to being human and that the Prophet ﷺ didn't die and all of these kind of uh, false beliefs and etiquette and creed. These actually have to do with creed about how you view the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He Salawatu Rabbi Wasallam Alaihi said he died. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. As the Sahaba Radiallahu Ta'ala Anu Mijra'een uh, affirmed as well. So very important for us to understand and not try to, this hadith illustrates for us the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not divine. That we don't give divinity to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was not God-like. He was not uh, he was a messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he was not an, an angel. He was not a law. He was not a part of Allah, subhanahu wa taala. So very important for us to understand and know and affirm that because that is itqad, that is creed. Uh, another, uh, likewise, Allah subhanahu wa taala says fi kitab al kareem, Allah subhanahu wa taala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said. Kul innama ana bashru mithlukum yuha ilay. Verily, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Say, uh, verily I am a, a, a human, a bashr, like you. Meaning like the rest of the, uh, the other mankind. Yuha uh, ilay. I, I receive revelation. I uh, have revelation revealed unto me. So letting us know the Prophet ﷺ was not like your ordinary man. He was exceptional in that he was a prophet in Islam, the best of mankind. And he received revelation and all of the things that came with being a messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also is a refutation of those narrations that are uh, related that people narrated on the Prophet ﷺ saying that he had no shade uh, and, and, and narration such as this. So this shows us the Prophet ﷺ that he, Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, this is an authentic hadith, that he وسلم, was a human being like us and he died وسلم, and he had sickness Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another benefit of this hadith is that the prop is that we learn also and it affirms for us that the Prophet Sallallahu died as human beings died. He died, had a real death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that he was uh, uh, buried and you know went through the burial rites, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that all Muslims uh, receive. And so this shows the humanness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that we should not exalt him above his status, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the perfect, uh, the perfect justice of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he was the most just from amongst us. And, and that's why he asked his wives and they knew and understood. He said, you know, where will I be tomorrow? Because they understood that Aisha was favored to him, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And that he wanted that. So that's what they, they gave him.
and that shows the just, the, the greatness in the excellent manners of his wives. Uh, this also shows us, and so this illustrates the excellence of the Ummahat al uh, Another benefit of this hadith is also this hadith shows the excellence of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and, and that she was preferred uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made preference and, 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 and loved her uh, you know his heart inclined to her even more so than his other wives and that's where he wanted to to be uh, during his sickness sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the next hadith Narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intended to go on a journey, he cast lots amongst his wives. Then he would take with him the one who was chosen by the lot, Mutafqun uh, This hadith shows, gives us some important benefits. And this is that when a husband has more than one wife, and he's going to travel that he should uh, if he's unable to travel with all of his wives you know that they're agreeable and that there's uh, no excessive friction or what have you and that there's maslaha there's benefit in that uh, but if he is unable to do so then he should draw lots in order to choose unless they have some type of agreement but from the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to draw lots so one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows the excellent justice of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that he was just. Another benefit of this hadith is that uh, drawing lots is a Sharia way because we learned this from this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this hadith affirms that for us that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, not only allowed that but practiced that of the drawing of lots, you know, the drawing of straws or what have you, in order to. Uh, uh, make a choice with regards to uh, the who he would travel with uh, on his who he would take with him on his journey from amongst his wives. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that the one also what the scholars uh, deduce from this hadith is that when they draw lots that the time for example a husband he draws lots uh, and he travels with a wife who was the one whose name came up for three days for example and then he returns from his journey uh, this hadith illustrates for us that there is no qada there's no making up for that time meaning that he would start his qism with the next wife, but there would not, but she would not get three days just because the other one traveled. So that's the point here, is that there is no qada uh, uh, for the time that was missed. So this, the one who whose name come up, they received an extra uh, benefit from that that travel. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. In the last hadith of this uh, chapter is an incredibly important and also controversial hadith. And again, as we're ordered to follow the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even these controversial issues which are controversial to us in this time especially, uh, that we have to know and understand that if something is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then there has, there's good in it. And that means... Uh, <laughs> that it is uh, worthy of practice and if it is something which is not that we're not ordered to do and that we're not uh, that you don't say that it's something it's recommended to do or something but that it's allowable then we should put everything in its proper and appropriate place in that it's maybe a permissible practice does not mean that you have to necessarily practice that practice in your home unless there is some Maslaha. Everything is built upon maslaha, on, on benefit. Unless it is, of course, as we mentioned, uh, al-amr, al-amr yifid al-wujub, that there's a command 
in which it shows that it's an obligation or showing uh, some other Dalil comes which illustrates that this command is uh, something which is recommended and so we have to understand the different levels of the Sunnah so in this last hadith in this chapter narrated Abdullah bin Zam'a radiallahu ta'ala an Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said none of you should whip his wife like the whipping of a slave reported by al-Bukhari uh, in this hadith it shows that it, it, it's strictly forbidden to beat the women and the explanation uh, the one who explains in this uh, Balul Quran set says except for one violation and that is in the case of illegal sexual relations it is not allowed to hit her on the face or to beat her so severely that one would break a bone or uh, in which case one will have to bear the penalty. Uh, with regards to this practice, it's very important. So the scholars, although there's uh, a lot of differences uh, viewpoint from scholars, uh, scholars that are uh, scholars of Ahl Sunnah, and as far as this practice and how to practice it, we know from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, which we must establish this because and this is even better for our understanding in our hearts to know that the Prophet ﷺ did not beat his wives. So if you want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and of course these issues are built upon Maslaha in most countries and most places you're unable to do that or in many places legally especially in Western countries it's not permissible. I guess in many other countries it may be uh, something which is widespread and maybe there's no penalty tied to it or men have a lot of leeway in this and a lot of abuse and harm occurs but however Islam as the Prophet ﷺ said la darar wa la dirar that there's no harm and there's no reciprocating harm that this is the Qaeda this is what we're responsible for following and that's the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ following in Islam in its complete way and from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, is that he did not hit his wives. He did not hit his wives. So in most situations, this is something which is unnecessary. And most situations, you'll find that there's harm in that. However, with that being said, that does not mean it's impermissible under all circumstances. So that's why it's very important uh, to understand this hadith and the ayat, uh, the ayat that mentions, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, the stages of dealing with a wife who is disobedient, who is not obeying her husband in righteousness, who's following him, who's not, who's being disobedient. For example, the woman who doesn't listen to her husband and he says, no, I, I want you to stay home because I don't want you out in the streets and this and this and this, or I know you have some harmful friends, some that I don't like, I don't want you to visit them. And she says, no, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm free. I'm this and that and the other. And she visits her harmful friends and she stays with them. So the appropriate way for dealing with that of course, is at first uh, to, to, of course, advise them and, and try to bring them back to good. And if that does not work after, you know, trying to advise her and everyone has to determine what is acceptable in their own home as far as advice uh, and as far as the extent of her being disobedient, then uh, the man can uh, uh, make hajr of her. You know, to separate from her bed. You know, not sleep in the same bed with her. And this is a form of uh, punishment, so to speak, because this has an effect on the men and the women, but especially the women as well, uh, that, you know, they tend to be more affectionate. So when the husband has cut them, uh, you know, distance himself from her, then the concept is, and in probably more traditional societies, the women... Are affected by this more so uh, then if that is not uh, uh, effective then the last step as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that would be the permissibility of uh, uh, what would as the scholars explain a light uh, type of uh, striking which is in order to uh, more so embarrass her that she was uh, you know, put in this position. And as mentioned prior to this, uh, culturally you have to 
you you have to consider the masalim wa mafasid because this is not something you're ordered uh, you're commanded to do as as uh, right off the get go to to do these practices and you have to look at the harms and the benefit if you're in a society where that's completely not uh, allowable then you can go to jail and you can experience immense problems, uh, a tarnishing of your name and everything else for doing this. As long and, and and also, depending on the culture of the women, them being resistant to that, a woman who will fight you to her earn utmost in some societies. So this is very important to consider all of these things, and be hesitant to rush into striking someone to strike your wife. That this should uh, be avoided. Uh, if at all possible, by any means, that this is a last resort, as Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not practice this practice. So there is many, uh, there is m much room and case for argument in how you deal with this, uh, how we understand this hadith. And this hadith actually is a hadith which is mana, which is actually showing the impermissibility of striking, especially. Any kind of anything that would be really truly harmful. The Prophet ﷺ said, "None of you should whip his wife like the whipping of a slave." No one. So there should be no comparison to how someone, because many of the people, unfortunately, because of their desires, they are unable to control their hands. Some men are very abusive from the get-go. Some cultures are very abusive inherently, and the men are very violent. And this has no place in Islam. But unfortunately, people do. Even we hear stories of people killing their spouse. وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ ضَلَالٍ So very important for us to know and understand and practice the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and understand the sunnah. The only way we can practice it properly is what? By properly understanding it and understanding some of the wisdoms behind it. So this lets us know that we should uh, be gentle with our wives and strive our utmost to avoid that. So one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows us that uh, that we don't prohibit that it's permissible to strike under because we have the, the Quranic text. But as far as how it's practiced, we see the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that he وسلم, didn't, pra didn't practice that. So if you want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, if you want to follow the Quran, then you follow the Sunnah, which was the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and you find that in most cases it is not necessary to do that. But at the same time, we don't make tahrim of that practice of uh, the light spanking to admonish or to, to embarrass if, she, if it, it's possible to do so. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows that the men have the uh, upper hand, that they are the leadership, that they should maintain leadership in their household over their wives that that is their role because they're responsible for taking care of them likewise they are responsible for their spiritual mental and other growth in their their household and a last benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us uh the importance of hikmah and wisdom and that the sharia is full of hikmah and that the student of knowledge and the person uh, doing knowledge that they should be a person of wisdom and that they should follow and understand the sunnah and by seeking knowledge in order to implement all aspects of the sunnah and follow it how the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam articulated and practiced and those are some of the most important benefits of this hadith chapter 6 al khula and this is the chapter uh, separating from a wife for a compensation. So that gives us a little bit of indication of a very important uh, aspect of regarding the marital bond. And this is actually when the bond is no longer maintainable and for whatever reason that the woman desires to leave her husband, to leave the marital bond. And so the hadith or a hadith that we'll study in this chapter, they are the next 
aspect or the next uh, topic that is contained within the book of marriage. So all of this is contained in the Kitab and Nikah, the book of marriage. And now we have reached those aspects which pertain to actually the dissolution of the marriage, the marital bond being broken. And so the Khula is the first chapter before getting into talaq or divorce. And we will talk with regards to this. These ahadith will make clear for us the uh, some of the differences between the khula and the talaq. Some of these masail will come up in this hadith uh, and from the explanation of Imam uh, bin Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala of these very hadith. Uh, in the 914th hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, the wife of Thabit bin Qais came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, O Allah's Messenger, I do not find fault with Thabit bin Qais radiallahu ta'ala an, in respect of his character or religion, but I dislike and fear that I might commit an act of kufr in Islam, that which is contradictory to Islamic behavior. Uh, Allah's Messenger وسلم, asked her, will you give him back his garden? And she replied, yes. So Allah's Messenger وسلم, said to him, accept the garden and divorce her with one pronouncement. Uh, and this was reported by Al-Bukhari, Another narration by him has, he commanded him to divorce her. Abu Dawood and a Tirmidhi reported this hadith and the later graded it as Hassan or, or sound. Uh, the wife of Thabit bin Qais got a divorce from him in return for a compensation paid by her. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made her, id, uh, her idda, uh, her waiting period, uh, one menstruation course. Ibn Majah reported the narration of Amr ibn Shu'ib on his father's authority from his grandfather. Thabit bin Qais was very unattractive and his wife said, were it not for fear of Allah when he entered my presence, I would spit in his face. Ahmed reported from Sahal ibn Abu Hathma's hadith that it was the first ever husband and wife separation for compensation in Islam. These ahadith are immensely important because they give us, and that's why Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, rahimahullah ta'ala, put this in his book, Bulugh al-Maram, that he put this hadith as the first hadith from when the marital bond is dissolved, when there is, uh, uh, you know, the marital, uh, the marriage cannot continue on going on because, and this is at the request of the wife, because the asl of, of talaq, of divorce, is that that is in the hands of the man. And al khula is when the request for divorce comes from the uh, from the side of the zoja from the from the uh, from the woman, and that can be done in several ways, as we will discuss. That can come from the woman herself, of course. It could come, uh, perhaps, uh, on on her behalf from the guardian or from the from the hakam, from the judge. And in regards to this. We also have to understand that the often in the situations in the West that we don't have uh, Islamic courts, we don't have the institutions, the Islamic institutions in place. So the communities often function like that if the communities are given that type of authority. So some communities have that in place where they give the imam that type of authority in order to dissolve a marriage and give the khulah. Actually, in fact, many of the communities do give that uh, power to the imam. 
And as far as marriage and, and regardless of whether, you know, they may make it a condition to get certificates or what have you. But this is something we don't generally possess in non-Muslim lands. We usually don't have a uh, Islamic courts or uh, a, a judge. But however, the imam, local imams or uh, perhaps state appointed um, judges or what have you may perform the same function. We're talking about state appointed uh, Muslim judges that might uh, perform that same function. The khula, <clears throat> it comes from the word khala'a, yakhla'u, khula. Uh, this word here, the khula, it means to dissolve something. You know, to, to, for something to be, uh, to cease to no longer be. Or to break something, like breaking a contract or something like this, or to remove something. To khallis minhu, to remove or uh, get rid of something. So, as a linguistic term, it often refers to uh, removing garments. You could say, khala'a arajul hidahu. Uh, the man, he removed his shoes. And so uh, the khula, this term, it refers to, uh, to, uh, to, to remove something. To remove something. Also, they use it uh, as a linguistic term to talk about removing one's garments, their clothing, uh, and so forth. The fukaha, uh, this, term, this terminology has a special meaning, which is the meaning which we're concerned about in the shir, and that has to do with when the husband and wife separate from the uh, request uh, the, or the desire of the woman. And this has a direct relevance because this is a type of removing something. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentioned that the men and the women are garments for one another. So you can see a similitude of where this this term, or that it's analogous uh, to where this term uh, developed from in the Arabic language. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Hunna libasul lukum wa antum libasul luhun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and you are a garment for them, and they are a garment for you. Meaning the, uh, you men, uh, the husbands, you are a garment for your wives. You protect them. You are a covering and pr protecting them from sin and helping them to be better Muslims. Likewise, they are a protection for you covering your sins and covering and, and protecting you from sin by being a halal means for you to uh, have your desires fulfilled and covering one another's faults and comforting one another. And this is some of the things that that uh, clothing does. Clothing, of course, protects you. Likewise, the husband and wife protect one another. So they are a libas. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the term libas. Libas refers to what? Libas in Arabic is also refers to clothing. This is my libas. This thobe, libas to uh, have a thobe. I uh, put this thobe on, or I wore this thobe, okay? So this is libas. So likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the term in the Quran, in the ayah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 187, where Allah ta'ala said, uh, Hunna libas al that they are a garment for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the term. And this uh, is, uh, has relevance because when the uh, woman requests this and they dissolve the marriage that this is at the request of the woman and this is a removing of that garment that no longer are you protectors of one another because now you have broken that bond which once established your family ties. Uh, another important point with regards to the khula and which is derived from the hadith is it also illustrates that there's a um, there's a a compensation 
and the scholars differ with regards to uh, the compensation, whether it be the mahar, is it permissible to take more, than, to ask for more than the mahar, because the husband is losing out, especially if it's a husband who desires his wife, and then she doesn't desire him, or she finds fault in his, his religion that she cannot live with, or whatever the case may be, uh, and there, there, sh there must be a compensation, as is illustrated in this hadith, in the hadith of, uh, of, uh, in the hadith of uh, Thabit bin Qais. And another point with regards to the khula is, as I mentioned, it could come from her wali. It could come from her, first and foremost. This is the khula, the, as the asl, or her wali. Her wali might communicate this on her behalf. Not that the wali has the right to just interrupt and dis destroy your marriage, no. But this is in the case if the woman, she's expressing to her wali, I don't want to be with him anymore for such and such and such a reason. He's a thief. He's uh, an adulteress. He's whatever. He's this and this and this regarding his manners or and, and, and his, his um, mannerisms. Or he is, um, uh, he doesn't pray anymore. Or whatever the case may be. So it could be from the janet of his religion or from his manners or what have you or whatever his sinfulness and so this can come from a uh, first and foremost comes from the zauja and then the wali uh, or even a man who is not directly involved in the in the marriage so meaning and and this is with a condition that Meaning that he not he not that he grants the divorce, but as far as the we're talking about the compensation. So the compensation could be from uh, the woman herself or her wali, or uh, you know some man who is not involved in their marriage, with the condition that he is not doing it to cause harm to the husband or harm at all. That there's maslaha, that there's some real true need for that. Uh, for him compensating. Sometimes maybe there's a, a violence in the marriage and argumentation and the people can't even communicate. So this man who is not directly involved in the marriage, maybe he decides to compensate in order for her to gain her khula. The man is stubborn. He doesn't want to divorce her. Maybe he wants to even harm her and not let her out of the marriage when she wants to be out and away from this man who is a, a tyrant. And so this other person, seen for the masla sharia, compensates, helps to, okay, you wanted uh, the, the mahar, I will pay the mahar you gave her back so that way you will, uh, you know, divorce her or, you know, the khula. Those are just some, uh, some important points with regards to the khula. Uh, another uh, point, important point that we want to mention before we get into the benefits of the hadith itself is that although the scholars differ over this and a lot of these masail pertaining to the khula, but this is the uh, view of Ben Uthameen and I, I adhere to this view, is that the khula is fisk. It is, uh, it's, it's dissolving the marriage, so it's different than the divorce. Meaning that because it is a dissolution, dissolution of the, the marital bond from the, uh, from the woman's side, that it is not considered talaq. So it is not counted as one of your talaq divorces. And by dissolving this marriage, they, that the people, the husband and wife, now that they are split, if they want to come back together, that they... Uh, must have a new nikah. They must have a new akt nikah. Some of the scholars hold the view that they cannot come back together. This is talaq uh, ba'in, that they are fully separated. They cannot marry until, of course, she marries someone else and he enters her. And as we, we talked about in the beginning, uh, in our first durus, our first lectures in the book of nikah. Uh, so, that this uh, does not count as a as one of the talaks, one of the divorces, 
and this is something separate. And likewise, the, the hukum pertaining to it, as the Prophet ﷺ said, and we'll see as we get into the hadith, and as we already mentioned the hadith, that there is compensation, and likewise, the idda, or the, uh, the, the, the waiting period before she can remarry is one month, is only one month, or, or one uh, height, you know, one um, uh, men menstruation cycle. So then that, uh, you know, differs, of course, with the, uh, with the divorce, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So in this hadith, uh, in these ahadith, there are many, many benefits. And before we get into the benefits, looking at some of the important facts, one of the hadith, one of them, uh, in the, the first hadith we mentioned, uh, it illustrated the taqwa and the fearfulness of, of the wife of Thabit bin Qais. That she did not want to harm his feeling, but she was concerned about her religion. She was fearful of her deen. So this shows the strength of her with regards to her deen, that she did not want to remain with him, remain in a marriage that she was so miserable in that she felt it might drive her to go back to disbelief. Or it might be, uh, you know, that she would be, uh, she would be harmed in her religion with regards to the marital bond. So she found it necessary to get out of that bond. Uh, let's go to the, the benefits because they will actually deal with directly uh, some of these these uh, the, the, the uh, main points of the hadith. So some of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith is the asl regarding the khula uh, from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the, the main evidence for the khula. Is this hadith coming from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is a very important hadith which uh, illustrates this very important hukum and that this is something which is permissible. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it is permissible for a woman to ask for divorce if uh, she is absolutely unable to stay with her husband. And so this hadith is evidence for that and something which is very, very important. And even though this was regarding, uh, this wasn't regarding his deen, she, she thought he had good religion and good manners, but she just was completely dissatisfied with his looks. She could not remain with him. She was not attracted to him. So much so that it was hurting her heart. Because for her to say what she said, as comes in the other narration, this shows this was a strong dislike. Even so much she felt that she it was hurting her religion to remain with him. Uh, an important point here, the Prophet wasallam said in a, another hadith, uh, whoever asks her husband for divorce without a legitimate reason, uh, then the smell of Jannah, of paradise, will be haram for them. This is a very powerful hadith, and this hadith is a hadith in, uh, narrated uh, and collected in Imam Ahmed, by Imam, in Muslim Imam Ahmed, uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, and this hadith shows us that to ask for the khula without a legitimate shari reason, that this is haram and a major sin as the threat of wa'id, the threat of punishment is mentioned in this uh, this other this hadith we just mentioned, so that it must be a legitimate Sharia reason that she cannot, as is, as it says, uh, that she is la to ma'zoj that she is unable to remain with her husband. Absolutely, because she's totally not attracted to him. She hates his look. She despises seeing him or despises something in his religion, his religion, he's foul, whatever the case may be. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows 
that is permissible for a woman to ask for divorce or for the khula uh, regarding the foul manners of a husband. So if she has a husband with bad manners, it's permissible. Uh, likewise, you know, or his, in his religion, uh, this hadith also illustrates that it is permissible for a woman to ask for a divorce uh, if she's displeased with the religion of her husband. And again, we shouldn't take these as light matters. And unfortunately, in some societies, the people are easy to get khula. They are so easy for one, for a simple reason. And they're, it's so easy to marry and divorce. It's just like switching. So you have some communities in which the women, unfortunately, have been married to half the masjid. And this is very, these are real stories to at least five, six times in the masjid, in the same community. That doesn't include maybe outside of that community. Wallahu mista'an. So this is a very tragic uh, situation. And this hadith is not illustrating and not evidence for being whimsical in merit, marital affairs by easily asking for divorce, easily asking for khula. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the Sahaba, the women and the men were very straightforward. They were straightforward when it came to their religion and even manners that other people might sometimes feel very shy about. And we talked about this in our last uh, hadith, you know, that the, the that in a hadith that uh, a woman, she, I think it was Imra'at Abi Talha, it was the, the wife of Abi Talha, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahi man al-haq. Verily Allah is, does, is not shy of the truth. So this is the, the, the way of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhuma ajma'een, is they were very straightforward because they wanted to know the hukum, they wanted to know the ruling so they could worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. That does not mean that they did not have immense shyness and that they were not the best, because they were the best. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma ajma'een, and they set the example for us. However, when it came to a lot of Sharia matters, they were very straightforward. And this is hadith is evidence to, to support that. This hadith also, uh, a benefit of this hadith, shows us that it is not blameworthy upon a person if they they ask for this khula for a legitimate reason, if this happened, that we shouldn't blame them and uh, treat ostracize them. Another benefit of this hadith is that if a woman, she asks for uh, to be separate from her husband, Uh, that that it's the right of the husband to ask for the mahar to be returned. That's his haq, that's his right. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith or these group of ahadith, they also show us uh, that if there are two parties that are having this dispute in the marriage that they should seek to get some sort of counseling and or you know go to before an Islamic judge who should not be quick to grant this khula unless the circumstances require that so that he listens to both parties and he tries to make rectification but if they are and, and that's in the case if they're both uh, they're trying to try to work things out and, and so forth. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, that if this is the desire of one, the separation is the desire from one party, meaning the wife, uh, then there is no need for necessarily bringing uh, two judges involved in the affair. Another benefit of this hadith uh, you know, to represent the two parties. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us uh, that it is uh, by that one can issue the khula even with the same lev or the same terminology as talaq. Because in the Arabic, it didn't mention in the hadith, it didn't mention khula, especially, uh, specifically, it mentioned talaq. 
and so that what is meant here is the is what is known as the khula and so it shows that they can both they can be uh you know if this comes from the woman's side then it it, it can be uh you know it comes from her request and the husband grants her request that this is khula this is khula regardless of whether she i want you to divorce me uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also, or these group of uh, hadith, they also show the uh, the fear of the wife of Thabit that she she did fear Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. She sought arbitration. She sought the Prophet ﷺ, his ruling. She said, you know, I, I, I fear Allah, but, I, you know, I fear kufr. I feel going back to disbelief because of him. I can't stand him. And even so much so that in, in one narration it mentioned that she said that she at times wanted to spit in his face. So that is a severe dislike or hatred for one another and it shows her good manners that she didn't do it and that she feared Allah in this affair and did not do such a thing. Uh, this also illustrates, which I think is from common knowledge, but it shows that spitting, obviously, at someone or spitting in their face is from enmity and is from hatred and is something that is uh, disliked and, and hated. And for some people, that's more severe than striking them. So it's a very serious uh, thing. And as we mentioned, that this was this this these ahadith uh, illustrate the first uh, khula in Islam and lay down the foundation for that hukum. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wassalamu alaikum wa sallam ala Nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.